Okay guys, this is my COVID-19 vlog number one. The date today, Monday the 16th of March. And on Mondays, I normally <laughs> teach the medical students at the hospital, but all the students have been sent home. And so I'm in A&E from now on gonna see uh, see what's happening. It's quite an interesting look for me because I actually haven't been in the department for two weeks. I was on annual leave and then last week getting the students ready for the exam. So I haven't really seen a lot of the action that's been going on. Uh, <laughs> you may also notice my car is full of my stuff. Uh, and that's because um, I'm currently living at my folks. So just with everything going on, you know, they're sort of over 70. So I'm moving out because I don't want to you know, put them at risk and bring anything back. Um, so I'm moving in with my boss, and she's uh, one of the consultant anaesthetists actually, and she's kind of heading up the stuff at the hospital with the, uh, the coronavirus. Considering, you know, the British government says this is the biggest public health crisis for the last, in our generation. So to have a look at it from a healthcare point of view, and you know, the, the World Health Organization now state that Europe's at the center, we're the epicenter of what's going on. So I thought I'd communicate that with you and give you guys a view on what's happening on the ground. Um, very much from a healthcare worker's point of view, I'm gonna try and find some other people that are, how they're dealing with it and like I say, how things are progressing. I'm heading into work now and I'll give you an update as things go throughout the day. I forgot to mention as well, <laughs> my name's Ed Hope. I'm a junior doctor in the UK and I normally do a channel about more light-hearted looks of medicine, but this is, uh, this is a very different time. So welcome to the channel if you're new. Everyone out there um, who knows me from the channel, thank you so much for your support. I've had loads of people sending me support, even though this is kind of like my first day on the ground dealing with it. Thank you very much and uh, let's see what happens. <laughs> So finding a parking space was as bad as ever. Had uh, two parking tickets in the last year. Loving that. So, so far in the UK, we've had 1,372 cases of coronavirus confirmed. Don't forget guys that 80% of people will be fine. They'll have mild symptoms, they can stay at home, they can manage. So today we're gonna to be seeing the 20% of people that are really struggling. So it may seem like things are bad, you know, if we do see some cases. But just remember that these are the people that are really struggling from it. So now I'm going to get out of my Canadian tuxedo, get changed into some scrub, check in with you guys later. Very important too that we clean these bad boys because they're going to be put on every single patient chest that we see. So it is half past seven in the evening, just having a little break. What's been going on? Well, there's definitely a change. Things feel different, but in terms of patients we're seeing, not really kind of there yet. So all the people that are like panic buying and everything out, you know, that's very much your doing. That's not the kind of coronavirus doing it because we're not seeing that kind of big changes yet. But I know if you look at all the kind of mapping that things have done out, we are expecting things to get a lot worse. We are seeing query COVID-19 cases. We've had, you know, a few in today, um, but I haven't seen any personally. I've had seen some people that have been low risk, but I think their kind of symptoms were due to other things. But obviously we're taking precautions in those low risk patients. So having to wear masks and uh, aprons and gloves and obviously washing our hands regularly. But, you know, we do that anyway uh, in the emergency department while everywhere in hospital. So the biggest change is not necessarily the patients. It's worth saying that obviously we have all the normal patients that we're seeing anyway. You can kind of forget that. You know, most of the people I've seen have definitely not been coronavirus. They've just been general A&E admissions. Um, and you know, those patients are also worried about the coronavirus, that they kind of might have it. Is that causing their symptoms? Or even are they gonna get exposed to it being at hospital? So I've seen people you know, wearing masks, just you know, sitting in the waiting room, which you know, there's not necessarily evidence for, but you know, people are doing everything they can, aren't they? And it's making up a lot of the chat that I'm having between all the staff members. It's, you know, the front of everyone's mind. And the real opinion is, you know, really split. Like people are, some people are quite worried about it and other people, you know, feel like, um, you know, we're, we've got time and we've got time to prepare and that type of thing. I think um, we're seeing a lot of preparation um, tomorrow I'm getting uh, 
a mask fitted, like, um, so one of the, if there's any high risk patients, so I'll try and record that. Uh, that might be. I saw some people having it done. It looked a bit bizarre, like they were about to be a beekeeper or something. Um, but yeah, so the take home message is kind of a, a change in attitude, but we're not really seeing a sort of change in you know number of people you know on the ground. We have had some people actually ad admitted that have been like that, but none, none that I've seen so far. Okay, I'm going to have something to eat and crack on with a shift. Yeah, so second half of the shift was much the same. Um, I didn't see any potential case myself. Having said that, there were a bunch of patients that my colleagues saw that they had high suspicions for. And it's worth noting that the high risk patients actually are dealt with in a kind of pod system. So they're seen, they're isolated as soon as they come in, you know, rightly so, and are seen by like a, a specialist team in, in full kind of gear and things. Um, so, you know, Maybe I'll get exposure to that at some point. <laughs> I think exposure's the wrong word. Anyway, so I'm heading home now. I'm gonna see my new housemate. So back home now in my new residence for goodness knows how long. It's weird that we see this kind of change in attitude and I was hearing kind of musings about how we're preparing for things, which I'll hopefully cover in other videos, but this kind of calmness before i've heard it described as the calm before the storm and also someone described it as a wave coming out before <laughs> before it like starts starts a tsunami what we're all scared about is what's been happening in other parts of the world particularly where it all originated in china but also in italy as well because you know a place that you know didn't have the first spread has had this massive impact on its health system you know this might be a video that i look back on and thought what was i worried about things were busy but not that bad or even the opposite thought little did i know what was about to happen I mean, only time will tell. I saw this interesting post actually. So this is a post on Twitter from a Sylvia Stringahini. I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. She's an epidemiologist, um, but she's actually translated very, you know, these very kind of interesting insight from an ICU physician in Bergamo, that's in Northern Italy, um, Dr. Daniel Maschini. And I'm just gonna read a few bits to you because a lot of it is sounding like kind of what I'm seeing at the moment. So he says here, after much thought about whether and what to write about what is happening to us, I felt that silence was not responsible. I will therefore try to convey to people far from our reality what we are living in Bergamo in these days of COVID-19 pandemic. I understand the need not to create panic, but when the message of the dangerousness of what is happening does not reach people, I shudder. I myself watch with some amazement the reorganisation of the entire hospital in the past week when our current enemy was still in the shadows. The wards slowly emptied, elective activities were interrupted, intensive care were freed up to create as many beds as possible. All this rapid transformation brought an atmosphere of silence and surreal emptiness to the corridors of the hospital that we did not yet understand, waiting for a war that was yet to begun and that many, including me, were not so sure would ever come with such ferocity. I still remember my night call a week ago when I was waiting for the results of a swab. When I think about it, my anxiety over one possible case seems almost ridiculous and unjustified now that I've seen what's happening. Well, the situation now is dramatic, to say the least. The war has literally exploded and battles are uninterrupted day and night. But now that need for beds has arrived in all its drama. One after the other, the departments have been emptied to fill up at impressive pace. The boards with the names of the patients of different colours depending on the operating unit are now all red and instead of surgery, you see the diagnosis, which is always the damn same bilateral interstitial pneumonia. Now explain to me which flu virus causes such a rapid drama. And while there are still people who boast of not being afraid by ignoring directions, protesting because their normal routine is temporarily put in crisis, the epidemiological disaster is taking place and there are no more surgeons, urologists, orthopaedics. We are only doctors who suddenly became part of a single team to face this tsunami that has overwhelmed us. Cases are multiplying. We arrive at a rate of 15 to 20 admissions per day, all for the same reason. The results of the swabs now come one after the other, positive, 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 suddenly the ER is collapsing. 
Reasons for the access always the same. Fever and breathing difficulties, fever and a cough, respiratory failure. Radiology reports always the same. Bilateral interstitial pneumonia, bilateral interstitial pneumonia, all to be hospitalised. Someone already to be intubated and go to intensive care. For others, it's too late. Every ventilator becomes like gold. Those in operating theatres that have now suspended their non-urgent activity become intensive care places that did not exist before. The staff is exhausted. I saw the tiredness on faces that didn't know what it was, despite the already exhausting workloads they had. I saw a solidarity of all of us who never failed to go to our internist colleagues to ask, what can I do for you now? Doctors who move beds and transfer patients who administer therapies instead of nurses. Nurses with tears in their eyes because we cannot save everyone and the vital parameters of several patients at the same time reveal an already marked density. There are no more shifts, no more hours. Social life is suspended for us. We no longer see our families for fear of infecting them. Some of us have already become infected despite the protocols. Some of our colleagues who are infected also have infected relatives and some of their relatives are already struggling life and between life and death. We just try to make ourselves useful. You should do the same. We influence the life and death of a few dozen people. You and yours, many more. Share this message. We must spread the word to prevent what is happening here from happening all over Italy. Pretty dark words, particularly because what he was saying here about the reorganisation of the wards is kind of something we're witnessing a little bit at the moment. Watching amazement at the reorganisation of the entire hospital in the last week. So these are the changes that I'm seeing at the moment in my hospitals. So is this post a kind of reflection on things to come? I guess we'll wait and see.